Hello, and I'm looking at this camera right here, right? No, I'm looking at the camera way back there. Hi, I'm, I'm Jonah Goldberg. Um, I'm the moderator of this Google, Google Hangout session. Um, and we're going to be talking. Do I have everybody in these other strange places? I see Jim and, OK, great. Um, so we're, we're here to uh, talk about the role of the, the new media and the digital revolution and its relationship to liberty. Um, if I, I think in the, the spirit of liberty, um, maybe we should go around and have everybody just introduce themselves. Uh, that way, uh, they can tell us what they think is the most important thing about them, rather than me trying to decide what it is. Uh, why don't we just start with Kevin? So I'm Kevin Sutcliffe. I'm the European programming editor for Vice News, a newly launched news channel from Vice Media. And to my to my right, um, at least physically. Um, I'm Paul Sainz, I run the Guida Fox blog, which is a political website which is quite popular, and I wish I'd invented Vice. <laughs> uh, and then we have out in the internet somewhere, uh, uh, we have two Jims. Why don't we do the Jim from BuzzFeed first? Hello, I'm Jim from BuzzFeed. <laughs> that was easy enough. And then we have my colleague Jim Garrity from National Review, who owes me money. I'm the author of a fantastic new novel called The Weed Agency. Uh, Jim, can you say hi? I can say hi. You've left me nothing else to say, Jonah, uh, other than it's available on Amazon. Excellent. Uh, so why don't we sort of just, uh, why don't I start with, with Paul. Um, why don't you just sort of give me your sense of what the lay of the land is with, with the digital revolution and the, the world of liberty and all that. The gist of uh, my view on the digital revolution is two-sided. Uh, in the 80s, I was one of those kids who went out to uh, Eastern Europe with a fax machine. For those of you who are under 30 years old, a fax machine is a device for sending a message via your uh, in uh, phone connection to another person. It's a page size thing. It's basically like Instagram, but slower. Um, and I would take these fax machines in, in a in a bag and go to uh, East Germany, I can speak a little German, and I would say to them, it's a photocopier. I don't know why it was a great idea, but we thought photocopier was a good thing. And they would say, are you a businessman? And I'd say, yes, and we'd give it to them, and they'd go, okay. And they would say, uh, uh, I check you out when you come back, and then we wouldn't come back with the fax machine. That was very simple, because these dissidents would then fax uh, British papers, in my case, or Western papers, with the news they had. Which is a, it was, this is a revolutionary distribution mechanism. And I used to be a speech writer, and I wrote a speech for a, I can't say who he is, but he owns a lot of papers. And I wrote a speech saying that, um, before him, and it said, uh, via fax machines and satellite te television companies, we will liberate Eastern Europe. And then uh, the Chinese read the speech, and Star TV was cut off. So you can <laughs> probably guess who the guy was. Um, I think the, the internet is a double-sided coin. It, on the one side, it does allow you to organize the Arab Spring. It also allows the Egyptian uh, military intelligence people to figure out who's on Facebook, who is organizing this, and then round you up and arrest you. So this applies doubly, as we know today, because um, the American and British intelligence services have admitted they are reading all our Facebook messaging, all our, uh, I don't know why they read my tweets, you can read them easily, but they're reading all our social media output. Now they say that's great because they're going to round up people who are threatening our freedom. I worry that it's actually taking away from my freedom. They know who I'm Snapchatting my testicles to. <laughs> uh, remind me not to give you my uh, Twitter address. Uh, Kevin, is it a double-edged sword? I think we're at an interesting point because I think, um, just to go back to the 80s, I was uh, post-punk where anything countercultural was cut up and Xeroxed, re Xeroxed and handed out as a magazine and the messages of opposition, the messages of uh, dissent were, were very small scale. Uh, they were in London or where you live. But it was a, a small gesture that uh, was important to the time. I think now uh, the, the, the ability uh, for the, the internet to to get dissent to, to manage change is extraordinary. Um, and I think we're engaged in a cat and mouse game rather than I think two sides of the coin. I think that 
people understand that the web is managed, people are chasing you down when you use it, and are very sophisticated in getting around that, and are very sophisticated at changing and shape-shifting to get their messages out. So it's an exciting and dangerous moment. Yes, you can be rounded up. Yes, the state can try and track you down, kick your door down because they thought you are on Facebook, but you can also get Tor browsers, you can go on the Silk Road. There's uh, any number of other ways now that people are getting messages out and going about their uh, business, or trying to express themselves, trying to find out things, holding truth to power in, in different ways. So I think it's, a, it's a, uh, to some extent, yes, there's, there's a downside to that because there's risk, because at some level you can be chased and found. At other levels it's very exciting because actually you can not be found. I was reading today the FBI had put out a, a list, and this list was for its operatives to try and understand the language used on Facebook. So at one level, the big, dark, evil, deep state uh, is tracking you down, trying to chase you, trying to find you out. On the other level, it doesn't want what lol means. So, <laughs> uh, you know, there's quite a, it's a quite, quite a complicated moment, but I think it's a very uh, exciting moment. Uh, yeah. And I see that through the Arab Spring. I'm, you see that now with, uh, for instance, the... Uh, the way that ISIS and the jihadis have uh, used the internet at the moment. There's a big debate about, well, should we be even publishing and republishing what they public? But their sophistication in the way they use social media is quite extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me it's one of the interesting things about technology is that you have these periods in human history where people think technology is all on the side of one faction or all on the side of another faction, right? The original Orwellian vision was that the state was going to use technology to oppress the individual and that it was going to lead to, to uh, you know, sort of eternal tyranny. And then it turned out that no technology was actually on the side of overthrowing tyranny. Um, communism claimed to have technology on its side and it turned out that, you know, by the 1980s they had to padlock their Xerox machines at night because they were so threatening to the regime. No, um, that's because I was bringing in. That's right, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, but, so, Jim Waterstone, um, are there other downsides? I mean, one of, one of the things, as I am now, uh, I think, officially in internet years older than Methuselah, um, I find that uh, you get these younger kids who have a, uh, have basically the, the attention span and the institutional memory of fruit flies. And uh, their ability to sort of read long form journalism um, of the sort that, you know, you guys at BuzzFeed consider to be sort of, uh, uh, you know, gone out with grandfather clocks, um, uh, seems to be really limited. Uh, have you led to the, have you personally and you at BuzzFeed led to the dumbing down of, of the next generation of millennials? Oh, I hope so. I hope if it gets rid of a load of dull, mid length political journalism, that would probably be the <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I, look, I've, I've only ever known political journalism while people like Paul have been doing the blog. Uh, I haven't known when you've had to read the lobby correspondence, when you've had to read just the 30-odd people who are allowed to report in Parliament. Um, if, uh, but that said, look, people will read stuff that they care about. They will read our 6,000-word essay on the words that authorise the invasion of Iraq, and they will read our gif of George Osborne looking creepy in a shop window. Um, there's not much in between, but the, you know you, you can mix and match. Uh, the one thing, the one thing, just going back to the ISIS point, which is particularly bizarre, is that you can see these guys on Twitter, on Instagram, with um, you know posting pictures of themselves with cats and cups of Earl Grey tea, and it's giving a window on uh, you know people who we'd normally ignore them or put them as terrorists, or well they are terrorists, but you normally never get their side of view. And it does challenge a lot of the preconceptions you have when you see these are just normal people. And it's quite troubling because we like to think of them as being anti-liberty. They're trying to impose their will on people, but they're still, you know, using the same same uh, ways of getting their message out there. Um, in terms of just on the the short attention span of the new generation, I, I meant to bring this up in the full panel. This is we're here at Guild Hall for the CPS Thatcher uh, 40th anniversary of Thatcher um, conference, and in when Margaret Thatcher, uh, who I dearly loved, when she, when she died, uh, the hashtag on Twitter was, Thatcher is dead. But all of these teenagers who didn't know who Margaret Thatcher was were freaking out because they thought it was, that Cher is dead. Um, they're like, what happened to Cher? You know? And um, you had to explain, no, it's actually this I woman. I that Margaret. might have been in America. That might have been, I'm sure it was, yeah. But uh, that's, that's our problem. 
Um, Jim Garrity, uh, where do you come down on all of this? Is, is, uh, have we made a deal with the devil with the internet? I think the double-edged sword metaphor fits very well because the good news, and periodically I have to remind out folks out in the conservative grassroots in the United States when they get too, too glum, too depressed, oh, Obama's on the march, we've lost the country, everything's miserable. I say, look, you've never had a better opportunity and a better, better set of circumstances for your voice to be heard. Uh, that you just you put your work, you don't need a printing press, you don't need a big distribution system. These things that used to require enormous resources are now right there in your laptop, and you can basically uh, write something and have it, you know, here I am talking to folks over in, in the UK, and it can be heard all around the world, um, and, you know, the, the traffic resources or, or the amount of attention that can be brought to bear by a drudge report can happen to just some random blogger. If you have some amazing story, uh, the attention can get there. You can get out your, your message, your ideas. The problem is that applies to absolutely everybody else on Earth simultaneously. And you all of a sudden, while you have this great opportunity to say what you have, want to say, to tell the stories you want to tell, and to call attention to the things that you think are important, everybody else does too. And now there's a lot more noise and a lot more competition, and there's kind of this just constant din. And so the question is, how do you stand out? And I think that it's a much tougher environment. So when we talk about the, you know, uh, middle-aged political journalism or stuff like that. Look, going back to the 80s, going back, there was a lot of, you know, uh, fat that could be trimmed in the media establishment at that time. Uh, but I think the competition in this new world has kind of squeezed out of it. The problem is, is that, um, I have kind of a second side effect of this, is that with so much constant, you know, uh, stuff coming, I think, I think, you know, they said that the New York Times and other publications now do like 10,000 items a day. When you add up all the blog posts, all of their news articles, all of the updates they do, all of the photo essays, and you know, vid chats like this one, all that kind of stuff, you're looking at like you know, 10,000 items, and no one in the world has enough time to read all that kind of stuff. Um, so everybody kind of gets their niche, and it gets one, it gets harder to have an impact beyond your niche and getting people's attention. Then something a lot of American conservatives have been kind of banging their head against the wall since 2012, realizing ah, we've been in an echo chamber the whole time these people who have tuned stuff out and who are paying attention to Kim Kardashian or something like that. And then I think the second consequence is that um, I, I can't speak to the media environment over there in the UK, but like a couple of weeks ago, Volk was a really huge deal. And I don't think I've heard anything about it in the US media for about two weeks. And after that, it was Ukraine and Russia, and now we don't hear about that. The VA scandal, Bo Bergdahl, and now this week it's Iraq. And, and this week, Iraq is going to be huge. And my guess is... Uh, looking at the track record of the Obama administration, at some point next week something terrible will happen, and the entire media world will pay attention to that. And each one of these, you know, the VA is still a mess. Uh, Russia and, and, and Ukraine are still at each other's throats, but the, the, you know, we, we have this short attention span public and this short attention span media that never really resolves any of these issues that they um, Great opportunities, but also I think a much greater challenge for anybody who wants to say, hey, here's why the ideas of the right or the ideas of libertarianism are good ideas. And rent. Yeah, so this raises an interesting question. Uh, not being a student of the British media landscape, um, though if someone wants to pay to have me come back, I'll study it. Um, uh, in the United States, there's an enormous amount of talk about, along the lines of what Jim is talking about, about this polarization, where people basically get into their news silos and they only read the news that they want to read, and it's leading to a polarized country. Uh, there was a, a big new study came out from Pew that found that the most politically informed people were also the most polarized people. That the people who were following news were the most likely to think the other side was completely wrong about everything. And the people who, both, who wanted everyone to get along were actually people who don't follow politics at all. Are you seeing something similar in the UK? And I, I wouldn't really speak about the UK because I think Vice News is global. So sure. What, sure. We, what we've noticed uh, are several things. One is that people crave an authenticity that they don't see in heritage media. Uh, and that's part of the agenda of things being talked about. I like heritage media. I'm going to use that. Um, and the, 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 the agenda is narrow and everybody seems to follow it, like small boys following a football on a football pitch. They all chase in one direction. And, and so one of the things we've noticed is that there was, a, in, in millennial terms, that uh, people did not like that anymore. They didn't like the tone of voice they were being spoken to. In, uh, but we've also found that there's an enormous interest in how the world works if we can tell it in an authentic manner. So we, we found out from research that 
people will watch 20 minutes of uh, video that is uh, from Somalia in a foreign language with subtitles, something that people thought was not possible for the under 35s, that somehow the conventional wisdom was that they won't watch that sort of stuff. Well, that's not true. What they want to find out, though, is, is what it's really like to be there, to feel that they're there, to feel that they're immersed in their life, someone else's life. So Vice News has come into, in, in, into being to try and deal with that uh, and try to um, speak to our audience, which is a large audience, um, about that. <clears throat> and I think that is a response to what was being explained about how people see um, the news media, maybe in North America, and to some extent here as well, uh, though I think maybe it was a different, different view. But I think the other thing that is and has developed over the last 20 years, and it started with satellite television, I think, is that people were, people were sat in their bedrooms in the north of England, uh, watching satellites from Kurdistan, watching satellite programs from uh, Iraq, Pakistan. They were choosing then, satellite was the only technology at the time, to, to find voices that really reinforced what they wanted to believe. And I think that is an issue on the internet. People's, people are choosing one view of things and they don't wish to be challenged. And I think that's quite Surprisingly, I agree with you on that, Kevin, because I think um, the polarisation of the media is a reality. Mm -hmm. And I, for one, am happy for that to happen in the UK. People are worried about, oh, we have the BBC in the middle, but we have. We don't have any broadcasters on either side. We have the BBC and we have people we all complain about in broadcasting. I don't think people are stupid. I think people who watch Fox News and MSBC in the States know what they're getting. What they want is their prejudice reaffirmed. And certainly in the British papers, the idea that people who buy the papers don't have a clue what the paper's line is is completely silly. It, but Guardian readers know what they're buying when they buy the Guardian. Telegraph readers know what they're buying when they buy the Telegraph. The, it's, it's completely condescending to think that the public doesn't have a clue or have an issue, understand which way their paper may lean. So what, I'm not worried about polarisation. I think people understand the polarisation. What I want is a more democratic media, a more um, pluralistic media. And in the UK, that means the BBC declining in importance. Because over here, we have a supposedly independent, middle-of-the-road, objective media. We're all forced to pay for. But some of us don't agree with it. So I, 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 I would love to see Guardian TV. I would love to see Telegraph TV. And I'm happy with that. And, you know, the Vice model works. You have, a, you have a, a, an exciting product that people want to buy. I don't think your readers are stupid and don't know where you're coming from. I think your readers know where you're coming from. Uh, Buzzfeed Jim, if you don't mind me calling you that, do you want to chime in on this? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, the one thing, people respond online to anything that's got an emotional pull on them, so as long as there is that, then they'll, they'll engage with it, uh, which is why you see some, some sites like Upworthy take it to a conclusion where it's the, this amazing video will blow your mind and change how you feel about politics in 37 seconds, which is probably pushing it a bit far. Um, but yeah, I mean, people aren't stupid. If, if you oversell them, our readers react really badly if you run the typical newspaper story of last night Labour condemned X or Y for happening to someone, because it just bores them senseless, and they don't care, and they don't want to know what a backbench MP thinks about something. They want to know the facts and then get out. Yeah, no, it's, it's funny. I, I've been making this argument in the context of the states, because what's happening in the, in the states is basically our media landscape is returning to the norm of Western culture, which is, you know, in Britain and in France and much of Western Europe, you always had newspapers with an ideological bent. You know, the Times is Tory and the Telegraph is conservative and the Guardian is Bolshevik or whatever. And um, in the United States, we had this weird cult of objectivity for about 40 years. And uh, it still endures in places like the New York Times. But uh, opinion journalism, or a, a journalism that tries to make an argument, is on the rise, on both the left and the right. And I prefer that kind of journalism because at least the author is honest with the reader about where he's coming from. And the best, I would argue that the best journalism is the really good, whether it's left wing or right wing, or non ideological. But it's the argument it is the it is the kind of journalism where someone in long form says, "Here's what I believe. Here's what the other side believes." and then tries to openly and honestly engage their best arguments, not their worst ones, to try and persuade the reader to agree with them. 
I would much rather that than have this sort of all the agenda of the author hidden and not confessed. Um, and I think that's one of the things that is sort of changing in the United States media landscape is that um, people who have strong points of view and make arguments are actually getting a lot more success these days than they did in the past. Uh, Brother Jim Garrity? Yeah, um, I guess every, every year or so, you, you begin to hear a bit of discussion in media circles that long-form journalism is coming back. Uh, and I guess the New Yorker gets a lot of credit for these sorts of things. What happens is that, you know, some particularly striking uh, good long-form pieces of journalism will come out. Sometimes it gets spun into books or something. And everyone says, oh, they're back. That's great. Uh, there's just two big challenges there. One is that they're hard. Uh, not as easy to do, that they require enormous amounts of time and, and effort and resources. Um, you're, you're not constantly putting up new constant updates for new clicks and stuff like that. And um, I, I, there aren't necessarily that many media institutions that are built for that kind of patience. You know, that if you're going to do, say, investigative journalism, you have to be willing to, to dig, dig some dry holes. And yeah, that lead didn't check out or something like that. And if you're in an environment where um, Increasingly, you know, on the one hand, I'm sorry, as I've been talking about the, the, the fat that used to exist in uh, uh, what you want to call middle aged political journalism or whether you want to call it uh, uh, heritage journalism, which I think is a really great phrase. You never, if people bought the newspaper, you never knew what they were. Um, in this country, USA Today, used to sell very well, and there are apparently a lot of people who buy, this, you buy take the sports section, throw the rest of the paper away. But the people who run the paper don't care because as long as you're reading, as long as you're picking up, they get their 50 cents or whatever the, uh, the amount was. Well, now with, with measuring clicks, you know exactly what is popular and exactly what is not. And so obviously if you have a very long detailed economics piece with lots of numbers in it, um, people are not checking that out, but they're looking at lots and lots of cat gifts. And uh, that's, you know, and, and so as a result of that, the tendency is, all right, let's give people more cat gifts and maybe give them a little bit of vegetables with, the, uh, with all the sweet stuff that they want to have. Um, I, I certainly hope long-form journalism can continue to thrive. And i got to say, you know, despite the... Uh, in some of my circles, BuzzFeed is mocked uh, for cat gifts and stuff like that. But they actually, at least the U.S. Uh, folks, and I have no doubt that the, the U.K. folks would be different, they actually do long-form journalism. They actually do go out and have reporters on the ground investigating these sorts of things. Um, it's interesting that the reputation or the perception of cute little lists and funny gifts and stuff like that kind of sticks with them. Um, I do kind of enjoy making fun of the Huffington Post and its nipple slip pictures uh, <laughs> because I really have a hard time taking your assessment of economics when you're like, whoo, Natalie Portman, you know. Um, <laughs> so I, I do kind of wonder if certain brands are getting watered down and, and you know. It's at that point, once you've brought people in for the Natalie Portman nipple slip picture, are they really going to stick around for the economics arguments? I kind of wonder, you know, unless you can like directly tie the <laughs> graphics. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, I think it's a, it's a more challenging environment for those in journalism uh, to retain the attention of, of the readers. As we said, perhaps you get, you know, conditioned to expect where the cat gifts and the, uh, and the nipple slip picks, which is exactly what I expect to be talking about on this panel. Yeah, and I, I, I'm waiting for you to bring up side boob, which is, you know, I think attributable to about 60% of the Huffington Post's traffic. Um, now, we're going to turn this into an interactive kind of thing at some point, right? Take questions from the teeming audience in this room, um, and also from the hundreds of millions of people across the continent and the globe on um, Google. So why don't we start in the audience, in the physical, the three-dimensional audience, and then we'll find some non-humans. Anybody have any questions, concerns, rants, defenses of side group picks? <laughs> we can cover it all. Anybody out there in the, on the interwebs? Lurking, I, 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 I apologize for not um, working out exactly how we're going to do this part, but I'm looking at a screen. Jim, it would be, hard, Garrity, it would be horrifying to know that we're looking at a sort of big brother size picture of your face right now. Um, <laughs> I, I was noticing there's something about Google Chats that gives you a fantastic view of the nostrils of what everyone <laughs> looks like. And so it's, it's if you're standing very close to me and you're short. Uh, so this is what I look like to my kids when I'm saying, you know, you really should have cleaned your room or something like that. So, so bizarrely, I'd like to defend uh, my rivals at Huffington Post and BuzzFeed for the cats and everything. You have to pay the bills. True. And it, if you, it, the strategy that these guys have is to get traffic and hopefully they'll come to the serious stuff. So we don't bother with the cats too much. If, if a politician wants to get their boobs out, side boobs or whatever, we are completely up for that. But um, 
this, it, they are doing side boob and the cats to get enough traffic to pay for the political stuff that they do. Yeah, no, I, 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 I no problem. Why else would Ariana Huffington be making all her money out of side boob? Right, right. I mean, there's nothing, nothing right. inherent to her mission that says side boob is what we got into this business for, right? It's, I, I don't know. It, 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 you know it, better than me. The point you made earlier, though, um, is a good one, which is um, what we can do now is we know so much more about our audience. Um, and there's sort of 20 years ago, throwing a newspaper into the street, somebody buying it, that was sort of it. But now, you know, the, the, the amount of research, the knowledge you've got of your audience, and what they want and how they're responding minutely now to the pieces you're posting uh, gives you an amazing insight into who's out there and, and how you can relate to the audience. You get to know your audience. And to what purpose, Kevin? I think that so you can... Make more money. Uh, <laughs> I said, no, I think so, purpose, so you can grow, yeah, so you can grow, so you can increase the reach, so you can understand, as we've done for the research we've done, the sorts of interests from the age group that we're serving. So the fact that we post 20 minute, 22 minute, 25 minute videos, the equivalent, I guess, of long form, uh, is in itself relatively unusual, supposedly for that age group, but we found that out because we're able to post things and then work out. But if, if, if they are 20 million of them, I set fire to my farts on YouTube, what is your purpose? No, I'm not doing that. Okay, I mean, there is a little... I mean, we, you know, we're, we're going to South Sudan to show you what it's like. We're going to Syria, we're going but to... But I've done interviews with, you know, have I done drugs with politicians and vice, <laughs> you know, kind of... I know, have you? Yeah, but I didn't name anyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we have a question from somebody. Hello, I'm Dan Sell from the Lincoln Republic, and you did mention that the most polarized readers tend to be the ones that actually follow the news and that the more centrist ones tend to be the ones that follow little or don't follow at all and I was just thinking about websites like Reddit where you get like links to the, uh, to the news but most people don't actually read the news that you see the headline and then go in the comment section and have a big debate without even reading about it and then form uh, I wouldn't say extremist opinions but quite polarized ones so right. I was wondering is it better to have people that avoid news or to have people that like have very little information very little information about it because the internet does give you information but sometimes very little is, is that doing more harm than good well i mean there's some things whether they're i mean the internet is very large right and so uh it's going to have like any large cultural institution, it's going to have aspects to it that are good and aspects to it that are bad. The question is, are you going to do anything about it? And if you're not going to do anything about it, you know, and we're not going to tell people that they can't say, you know, that if you disagree with me about Game of Thrones, you're worse than Hitler. You know, that's fine. They're going to say that, and that they have this free speech right to say that. Um, I do think, though, that, I mean, and I am so not a gitchy goo kind of good citizenship kind of guy. But I, I do find it troubling when you see this data about people who watch The Daily Show, which is this comedy show in the States, right? It's all making jokes about what's going on in the news. That for significant numbers of millennials, that is their only source of news. And I don't get it. I don't get how you can watch a show that's making fun of politics and what's going on in Washington if you don't actually know what's going on in Washington. I mean, it's this way that they sort of... Um, they think it's, act they, they, I mean, I know that people are smart, and you know, I take your points that people know what they're getting from The Guardian and all of the rest, but just as a matter of informational, information gathering, if all you're doing is watching one comedy show, and you're not reading the newspaper, and you're not reading the news sites, and you're only looking at the side boob and all the rest, that does have knock-on negative effects for, for society. That said, the notion that America um, and I can only really speak with any expertise about America, you know, much that America was ever this country where people weren't divided over politics is, is really myth-making, you know, and the people talk about how partisan Congress is today. Well, you know, 150 years ago, one guy was almost beaten to death by another guy on the floor of the house with a cane. Um, you know, we had, people say we're the most polarized we've ever been, you know, except for this thing called the Civil War where 600,000 Americans killed each other. Um, uh, so the, this notion that the divisions are worse now, I think it's just that they're e because of the data revolution, they're easier to see and it's easier to hide in your own group in ways that 
sort of like die markers in the culture, but that's okay. Democracy is about disagreement, not about agreement. I, th I think you shouldn't underestimate the value and the uh, importance of infotainment because a lot of the uh, popular public, the uh, popular public, so uh, so you can say, a lot of the public only get the information from the popular press or the broadcasters. They are not interested in the detail of politics and the nuancing of it. They want a sense of where politicians are. So you know, I, I should declare that I work right for the Sun, the biggest selling newspaper in the country, and uh, my blog is the most popular blog. So I'm obviously sensitive to what I think is popular sentiment. And I think uh, there's a sort of elite view of politics, which is um, we have to explain all the you know, fiscal uh, details of this issue or monetary policy. Actually, what the public want is a sense of politics in a really quick, accessible way. And I want to deliver that in an entertaining way that's readable and have my readers get an understanding of politics from that. So when people say, oh, you know, they're not interested, the public are interested, but they haven't got the time. And I think that's a good thing that they're not bothered about wasting their life on politics. Um, and also, sorry, I was going to say also, perhaps your point is more an indictment of the way that uh, politics, uh, particularly on television in America, is delivered. That, yeah. that they're going elsewhere, or they're going to the Daily Show because they're not satisfied, don't believe, don't The Daily lie. Show is actually very yeah. accessible. It yeah. actually oh, does... Oh, it's a good show. I'm not saying that. Uh, no, I think it's got a slight left bias, but I think it is actually a good product. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a funny show. Unlike Bill Maher, I think John Stewart's actually very talented. I do want to get... Um, uh, BuzzFeed, Jim, in here, just very quickly, uh, where do you think, you know, so BuzzFeed right now is sort of, everyone says it's on the cutting edge of, of where the internet is going. Where do you think the internet is going, your post-BuzzFeed, or how is it changing for the future? And, and note, I'm told by, by gremlins in my ear that we've got to wrap things up. Okay, well, uh, where the internet's going, if I knew that, I'd be like my boss who's sitting on a very wealthy uh, company right now. Um, in terms of what we're doing, all that's all that's going to be is we'll do more of the same. But it's going to you're going to see everyone's browsing us on our mobile. Everyone reads on mobile, and we try and entertain to that entertain those people. You have 30 seconds. They're walking from door to door. They've just got on the bus. They want something to entertain them, to inform them, and to get on and out of their life. They don't want to hang around and read a long piece. When we did a piece on the floods, we just did a load of politicians looking useless. It, it was read by more people than by a broadsheet newspaper in the UK. Does that help them politically, though? Um, it, it can. I mean, when I mean, in the same way that you run entertaining stories that have sort of been briefed by either side, we can do the same. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. I am sorry for some of the technological issues that we had, and I'm sorry for the fact that my passion is not moderating Google Chats. Um, but I want to thank everybody for being here and uh, keep interneting inside Google. Thank you. Mm -hmm.